Good morning, everyone. I'm Jasmine Chiu from SG Innovate. It is my honor to be your moderator for this panel discussion. Welcome to our event of AI and the future of ultrasound imaging. Before we start, I would like to give a quick introduction about SG Innovate in case you are new to our robust and engaging community. As you in, in a way was found in 2016, it was set up to help entrepreneurial scientists to build globally relevant deep tech startups. Our mottos are building from Singapore for the world and using deep tech to solve meaningful and diff difficult problems for the world. Our events always strive to bring like-minded people together to share this, their, their insightful perspective on important topics. Today, we are going to discuss a topic I'm personally passionate about. Just like all of you, I look forward to the opportunity to learn from our brilliant speakers how ultrasound imaging, one of the most widely used medical imaging technology and its diagnosis can leverage on the advancement of AI to become more accessible and more accurate, as well as driving better patient outcome. A quick note on the agenda. We will have a good solid discussion among the speakers first, then we will reserve 15 to 20 minutes for the Q&A session. I encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A chat box on Zoom. I and the speakers will try our best to address all the questions you have. Joining me today are two speakers, Caroline and Malos. Dr. Caroline, Director of the Clinical and Translational Research Office at National Heart Center Singapore, and co-founder of Echo.ai, a SG Innovates portfolio company. Malos is Senior Business Marketing Manager, Port of Care Ultrasound APEC, Philips. Next, I would like to invite our speakers to introduce themselves before we start the discussion. Caroline, please. Oh, thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, I am actually quite humbled to be here because the title is about AI and it's it's about, you know, starting a company. And frankly, I'm new to both. <laughs> so this is the first company that I've set up um, as a co-founder. Um, and AI is something I'm learning. And uh, what I do know about, though, is the last part that you mentioned about patients. And so I'm a senior cardiologist uh, at the National Heart Center and professor at Duke National University of Singapore and, and was happily so until we co-founded the company. So thank you. Thank you. Malos, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Caroline, and thank you, Jasmine. Um, I'm also very pleased to be here today. Um, I'm working as a business marketing manager for Point of Care Ultrasound. Um, just to clarify to everyone, Point of Care, uh, we're talking about the the environment where healthcare professionals provide care to their patients. And when we talk about ultrasound devices, we talk from the um, traditional ultra the ultrasound devices, so more the card based, the bigger system, to really the innovative ultra mobile ultrasound solutions you can just put in your pocket and take everywhere. So I'm really excited to talk about this combination of AI and ultrasound today. Great. Thank you very much, Marot. So cool. Let's dive in our discussion. So I would like to uh, raise the first question to our uh, panelists. Is, uh, I, I guess is on everybody's mind for the attendees. Is with the advent of AI, we see the huge potentials of it make ultrasound more accessible and more accurate. And we have read about diagnostic quality images being captured by medical staff with no ultrasound training. But let's think about to take one step further. Can we see the technology actually being deployed in the rural areas where it has no infrastructure like uh, urban areas can offer? What are some of the opportunities and considerations? Great. 
Shall I, shall I start from um, maybe a, a, a patient-centric approach? So um, yes. it's true, I, I love ultrasound. Um, I trained in echocardiography, which is ultrasound of the heart. And the beautiful thing about ultrasound is it's so safe. It's the kind of thing that we actually use to image the unborn fetus when we're pregnant, right? So it's so safe. And now, thanks to Marlowe's and companies like Philips, it's actually so portable that you could put it in your purse. It could just be a probe that really connects to a, a smartphone. Um, so I, I really think that there is huge potential here. Um, but can you imagine that if you put this technology in untrained hands, yes, we can see the image, but then how do we know whether what we're looking at is normal or not? And so I just wanted to, to tell you that that's where AI and specifically Echo AI sits. Um, we're a software, so we don't have the hardware that Philips and, and big companies produce, but we're the software that automatically can interpret these images and say what's normal and not normal. So do I think that this has application in rural settings? I frankly think even greater uh, application in rural settings. Uh, because right now, Today, if you want to get an ultrasound of the heart, you, you actually have to go to a specialist. We, you actually have to go to a cardiologist. Notice you can't get it uh, with general practitioners. And it's not because, again, that ultrasound is unsafe or you need a big machine, but it's because you need the expertise to interpret. So if we pair now the simpler portable hardware with really smart software, we can literally democratize ultrasound and put it in the hands of untrained individuals and even more in rural areas. Now here in Singapore, it's hard to talk about rural, but then, you know, we're, we're actually uh, putting in a grant now in Scotland where it's huge. And there, they have difficulties even meeting their guidelines of when echo needs to be done. Like you have to wait nine months to get an echo because you have to go to the specialist. So in cases like that, if we can, in the rural areas, equip nurses, equip general practitioners with handhelds and software, then it's even more important because then the screening can happen and you don't have to wait nine months to be diagnosed with heart disease. Great, yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Caroline. Um, and I, I would like to add on that. I think um, with uh, ultra mobile ultrasound devices and, and, and AI, we can provide better access to quality care. And I think that is where we need to focus on, on quality care, bringing the best care to our patients. And that can be either in urban areas as well as rural areas. And what we see today is that we are already able to bring ultrasound into the rural areas, midwives doing um, um, pregnancy scans, and we use tele ultrasound for that. So then the midwife is able to reach out to a specialist in the more urban areas. But that causes a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and we still need to involve the speci specialists. So I believe with AI, we can save time, but also improve the uh, diagnosis accuracy accuracy um, at the point of care. So it's really delivering that um, uh, diagnosis at that moment in time when you are with your patient. And I think um, AI in combination with, with ultrasound will enable us to provide or give uh, put ultrasound in the hands of new users as well as uh, deploying new use cases. That's such a great point. Jasmine, can I can I uh, sort of elaborate? Because uh, Marlos br brings up a very, very good point about the quality mm -hmm. of care. Um, and, you know, just sharing on a personal front, mm -hmm. this is actually how Echo AI was born. Mm -hmm. uh, the person who's now the CEO of the company, basically, you know, he, he went for a screening and uh, health screening. And at that time, he was already retired. He's a serial entrepreneur. He, he um, retired. Now, now you're picturing something with white hair and so on. No, he is quite young, uh, did really well. His last company IPO. And so and, and he decided to go for health screening. And of course, at a, at a general practitioner, all he could get was an electrocardiogram. That's different, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the electrical uh, signals of the heart said that something was very wrong. 
And so you can imagine immediately the first thing that he needs then is an ultrasound of the heart. You have to look at the heart to see if it's really abnormal or not. And he had to wait for a long time for the appointment and then got two different answers from two different doctors. And that goes to what you say that ultrasound is so easy to do and accessible, but the, the quality of interpreting it, uh, the reproducibility is, is really not good. We know that between readers, it can vary up to 20%. And unfortunately, that's what happened to poor uh, James Hare, basically. He got two answers and he was just like, what is going on here? Does the medical field know what they're doing? And so that's how he started, you know, looking into what we do and what he see. It, after an ultrasound image is captured by a technician, basically us cardiologists were sitting in dark rooms, spending hours and hours tracing the heart, measuring, and then trying to remember, is this normal or not for his age and size and, and uh, uh, race and so on. And so he immediately realized, wait a minute, this needs to be automated and not just that, to be completely reproducible. And there comes the quality, right? That, that you, you not only want to catch the image, but you need to make sure that it's interpreted accurately. So, so thankfully for him, one of the doctors who said that, it's with, that his heart's okay was the right one. And so he's fine. But, uh, but that was how Echo AI got born, actually. Yeah, great. Yeah. I think all the great uh, technology are uh, all derived from the a uh, mad needs, right? So yeah. The, yeah, and also a solution that um, like Echo.ai is condition driven because you see the problems uh, every day and then you well, want to... Yeah. Or someone else sees the problem and holds a mirror to my face. <laughs> you see, we, we train for, oh my God, we train for 20 years. It feels like, you know, before we, we, we become, you know, we have to be doctors and cardiologists, then echo trained, you know. So by the time you get that, you don't question the system mm -hmm. anymore. Everybody does it like this. And so we hate it. But we still sit there and we spend hours tracing and tracing. You know what I mean? So it took someone from the outside to actually show me that mm. there's a better way to do it. Mm. You know? anyway. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So which uh, lead to my next question is, so we were talking about the AI deployment is so great, right? Uh, to, to, uh, to your point that is to help the cardiologist uh, to cut down uh, all this tedious time, repetitive time, and then focus on more high value tasks. But so the flip side of this, right, will the specialists like yourself who are trained in imaging, you know, you are a cardiologist, you are trained to interpret and diagnose heart disease based on the uh, echocardiogram. Uh, and the technicians, right, as you mentioned, they are trained on the ultrasound data acquisition. Do you think that People like yourself, the specialists, uh, are you, uh, should you be worried of uh, your role will be make increasing irrelevant? And, uh, <laughs> and what, what will be the new yeah. job roles and opportunities for, um, for you, given the advance of uh, the AI technology? Yeah, Justin, you're spot on. So I have to admit, the first time I heard the idea of, of trying to automate everything we do um, was sadly no way, you know, this sort of skepticism, you know, for sure. And, and that continues to be something that I, I actually enjoy facing now. But in the beginning, I myself was the, the skeptic. And, you know, uh, I have to admit, you know, us doctors, we, we can be really um, a proud bunch but I think uh, just just please have pity on us because we, we really spent a lot of years mm -hmm. <laughs> doing okay. scud work and so yes I, I met it was met with skepticism and then it was met with also a little bit of wait a minute is someone trying to put me out of a job but then when it actually came to developing the project and then letting people test it and that's why I'm saying I now enjoy this the most because all of my colleagues who've seen this and work with this fall in love with it because it actually relieves them from doing things they hate, mm -hmm. we hate. It, it's not like we enjoy doing the tedious stuff. And so it makes us more efficient. It makes us able to do more studies in a shorter time with more accuracy. Everybody 
wants that. Uh, patients want that. We want that too, because there's a long line of people waiting for these ultrasound of the heart. So the, the more, the faster we do it, the more we can do. So in the end, it's turned out to be something very welcome. Now, of course, uh, the onus then is on us to produce the best darn product, product that we can. And, and to really, really um, put skeptics to rest, it's, it's by quality. That means, you know, really, really show them with data that this really is accurate and reproducible. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well said, uh, Caroline. Um, I, if I can add on that, um, I think from a solution company perspective, um, uh, we believe that AI can help to simplify complex, complex tasks. So that also means for the specialists that they can focus on more uh, advanced imaging, for example, fusion imaging, where we have a combination of ultrasound and X-ray to guide procedures in real time. So I think that is a really big benefit. So specialists can focus on that advanced imaging and more on the patient and patient outcome and patient experience. So I think that will free up some time. But I think also if we look at the whole um, patient journey and the care pathway, um, AI can now also then be used um, earlier in that patient journey. So really at the point of care when they are in first contact um, with the healthcare system, um, healthcare professionals can there already triage patients and decide upon the best patient management and only refer the patients that need that advanced imaging um, by the specialist. Yeah. Indeed. Great. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Malone, you are from a company with rich uh, innovation history and also a solid um, uh, business track record. Um, and um, Caroline, you, now you are co-founder of a startup. So, what are your respective vision for your companies? I let the big... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to Humble, start here. I'm yes. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Um, so I think what we um, aim for the future is that we want to leverage uh, the advanced technologies uh, that we're developing in combination with uh, deep clinical as well as customer or consumer insights uh, to deliver that integrated ultrasound solution including AI features, for example. Um, and we do that to, uh, to simplify those complex complex tasks, as I just mentioned, as well as to increase the access to quality care. Um, and all of this we do um, because we want to reduce the cost of care. We want to improve staff experience, patient experience, but also drive that uh, better patient outcome. So I think that is a little bit altogether um, how we see the, um, the future. Wow. Um, so as, as a small startup, I'm, I'm going to tell you this is the moonshot aim, right? But uh, um, the, the first is definitely clinically oriented. And it's kind of what uh, we had already been talking about, which is, you know, to put heart health in everybody's hands um, by having the smart software that can be paired with the mobile hardware. Um, and allowing a democratization, uh, you know, of, of mm. echocardiography. You see, as a cardiologist, what pains me the most is that we have the advanced treatments, be it devices, be it medications, be it surgeries to treat disease. But the problem is, it's picked up too late. Like we, you know, uh, an axiom that we always say is, you know, the commonest way a heart attack presents is dead. It's true before they even reach hospitals. So, you know, but yet you can see changes in the heart already early if we could only mm. make it more accessible to, yeah. to see it. So, so that is, is really, I mean, if, if I could see it in, in the hands of, of GPs first and then maybe in the community, that would just be a, a huge dream. But that's all the clinical aspect. And, and uh, to be honest, we're, we're small, but also have some other uh, ambitious goals. And, and it's in the research realm. Uh, in fact, Echo AI is already commercially uh, uh, sort of um, viable in this area where you see Echo images um, contain so much more information than any human being can extract. 
When I talk about echo images, I'm not talking about an echo report where we analyze words with yeah. natural language processing and so on. I'm talking about looking at the images. You see, human beings, we, we only analyze and cap and measure the heart at certain phases at the end of diastole when the heart is heart ventricle is biggest or the end of systole that that's all we do at two points of the heart cycle ai measures every single frame of the moving heart so we we can see a lot more patterns um, and then of course we all know that ai beyond making known human measurements can also do pattern recognition. It's like how AI can recognize your face from mine, you know, when we turn on our, our, our handheld. You know. So, so it, pattern recognition is also crucially important in heart disease. There are diseases like what we call amyloidosis, where even I, you know, we as, as human beings, we know I can look across the room without a single measurement at a heart, uh, uh, somebody else is looking and reporting a, a echo image and I can say that's amyloid. It's just you recognize something about the combination of the sparkly myocardium, the thickness of the wall, the valves look a little bit and you know it's a pattern. So all that is perfectly amenable to AI. So, so beyond the clinical diagnostic tool with known clinical um, applications, the whole research realm of predictive analytics, of designing better trials, of predicting earlier than we can now who will have events and outcomes, of predicting better who is likely to respond to what drug better, all of that is, is opened up once we can actually perform AI on the images. And Echo AI is, is, uh, is the, the tool that enables that to start. So I'm, I'm really excited about that too. Yeah, yeah, Caroline, I think it's really nice that you touched upon that point about um, not only focusing on the treatment phase, but really about the prevention phase. So you can see earlier um, in the patient journey, or maybe even they don't have any symptoms yet. You yeah. can already predict um, what is going to happen to the patient. So I think that is a really good point you all just highlighted. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and also I think uh, with the increasing accessibility of the uh, ultrasound imaging and the AI uh, modules, that this also can be a tool for the uh, population uh, uh, health management as well. That would be a dream. <laughs> okay, so next I would like to raise the question about, mm, so given uh, two of you representing uh, MNCs, and startups, right? Uh, what are the areas of collaborations uh, you think that it will make the most sense for, for us to, to push ultrasound to the next stage of development? Yeah, if, if I may start here, um, I think in the past we were selling products. Nowadays, we need to sell solutions. Um, and what I mean with that is that the world has become more complex, right? Um, it's um, a digital world and, and we now talk about ecosystems that we need to build together with hospitals. So that means that we need to find strategic partners, uh, strategic providers of care to deliver that total solutions. And I think there is a really strong need to work with um, uh, um, different different startups, different companies, healthcare providers to deliver that total uh, solution to deliver on the customer need as well. Because end of the day, we need to understand what is the customer need? How can we deliver that total solution? Who do we need? What aspects of the solution can we do in-house? And where do we need to find partners um, to collaborate with? Right. Marlo, that, that was elegantly put. Um, <laughs> uh, hard to add to that. I think um, uh, in my mind, partners is, is a definite term, but also the, the concept of synergism, like where one plus one becomes five, not two, you know. And, and I think here, um, I, I really, really think the partnership between a startup and a big uh, MNC really works. Uh, you see, the startup can be very nimble, but is forced to be very focused. It can move very fast, you know, 
the the MNC has the systems in place and the um, the, the connections, uh, the sales force, and so on. So I I think even in in that sense, it makes a lot of sense for small and big uh, to work together, building on the strengths in a synergistic way. But specifically, Equiai and Philips, if I if I may, you know, it's like perfect uh, synergy, synergism between hardware and software, you know, um, ours is only software. So I, I, I do think that's just uh, so exciting and, and uh, really hope uh, to be able to, to realize uh, these, these pilot projects where we may team up together uh, very soon. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, ask uh, Caroline that uh, we all know that to build the uh, uh, AI uh, capability, right? The, the access to a large and diverse uh, data set, healthcare data set um, uh, is uh, critical. So uh, what are the um, challenges you have been fa facing? Because for the data, we will automatically associate with uh, data security, privacy, uh, any um, also like ethical concerns and so on and so forth. So, uh, and how do you mitigate them for you to build your solution? Oh, Jasmine, you've, you've really, really hit the nail on the head. Those are the big issues and the ones that, you know, uh, frankly cause me a lot of headaches uh, uh, these days. Um, so the issue about medical data is that it's kept in silos and, um, you know, hospital systems, uh, really react with anaphylactic reaction, allergic reaction, when you mention anything about the cloud and a cloud-based solution, even though that honestly makes the most sense, right? And so we, we have to have to understand uh, data privacy and data security. That one's not negotiable. We, we, we understand it. But beyond that, there is also um, a mindset because sometimes, frankly, the cloud solution is actually a more secure solution than any other thing. But it's the mindset uh, and, and frankly, ignorance of a lot of us who work in hospital. We're just so used to something and, and we don't understand it fully, but we're afraid you know, to rock the boat. So it, it becomes um, the most important thing to ensure data security. And so a few of the things we had to do to, to go around this. Uh, number one, Echo AI had to build specific software to completely anonymize images. Just, just giving the solution, the, the, this um, option to our partners. Um, now, what does that mean? It means it can crop out any identifiers leaving only the image um, if the partner wants us to do that. Mm -hmm. Second, we have options for both cloud-based and uh, a local mm -hmm. desktop or a, a solution just so that you know we can just plug into the usual flow of things and, and so we work around it. But the third solution that I, I really, really almost came across by accident, honestly, is we built a federated learning platform. Mm -hmm. What happens there is, so, so here maybe, you know, the, the past decades I've spent um, in clinical research and establishing network of friends and family all around the world, you know, who are interested in heart disease. So this became something that, that I could connect with them and they have their databases and, um, we all want to work on the same thing. And so Echo AI software is now in various labs around the world, in Taiwan, in US, in Europe, um, and so on. Um, uh, and, and their data never ever leaves their premises and is completely secure. Mm -hmm. However, the algorithm can leave and mm -hmm. it, it enables a validation and learning across the multiple platforms in the world like never before. It's blows my mind even because uh, I, we mm. came across it by accident but the way this can happen is incredible because mm. in what used to take me as a fellow a year to analyze echoes in just one cohort in in Olmsted County at Mayo Clinic where I was training um, now it can happen in a week that we can analyze mm. and I can validate it in Taiwan just 
all in a week, you know. So the power of federated learning is 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 just amazing, and that was uh, one solution. Mm, wow, that's uh, great. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Caroline. Very interesting. Would love to hear more after <laughs> after the talk. Um, I, I just wanted to add uh, mm -hmm. on that. I think for every new solutions, I think um, uh, people are very critical no matter it's AI or something else. Yeah. I think there are always questions, right? And um, I think we always need to ask ourselves, does it complement and benefit our customers, our patients and our society? If we are feeling very confident about that, and I think then we can build that case. Um, but of course, we always need to take care of the privacy, the security and how we are going to use the data. Um, and I think that is no different than from any, any other solution we, uh, we bring to market. Yeah. Uh, and the reason we are doing an online event is because we are in a global pandemic. Right? So can, can you please touch on how your solutions support healthcare professionals and patients in situations like COVID-19 and to mitigate the disruptions and constraints caused by the pandemic? Sure. Um, Marlos, shall I shall I go? Because yeah, I yeah, think yeah. first I, I I just want to thank you, frankly, and Philips for POCUS. So this is what we call point of care ultrasound POCUS. And I'm telling you, it's everywhere now. I mean, um, I'm an editor for a journal and, and, and we basically have been publishing papers related to COVID and everyone talks about POCUS because the standard ultrasound with the big machine and, and, and things that we used to do would require moving a patient who needs to examine the heart to a separate room. So moving the patient, different staff, um, uh, different room, different equipment and so on. But now imagine because of innovations that come from companies like Philips, point of care means at the bedside, we just take out a probe look at the heart quickly um, and then, you know, minimize infection risk to both staff and, and patient and able to just wipe down that probe and, and that's it. So, so it, I would say that COVID has really all the more emphasized the need for point of care um, uh, ultrasound. It's more, it's even more highlighted the need for remote monitoring and cloud-based solutions. So I'm, I'm really frankly hoping that some of the lessons we've learned to open up our mindset a little bit to, um, you know, being able to do teleconsultation, telemedicine and so on will last after this. And this is where software and AI comes in. I mean, we just have to stop being so afraid of, um, of, of big data and sharing and learning together without compromising uh, patient security. So I think there's a big movement towards that. In fact, there are COVID registries being set up where you know uh, it's a direct to patient saying, can you contribute your data so that we can all learn together? And so maybe this is the kind of thing I hate to say that we needed um, to break down those silos. Hopefully we'll see. Yeah, yeah. definitely can turn into an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, very well said, Caroline, again. Um, I think really you explained very well the advantages of POCUS, uh, bringing the ultrasound at the bedside of the patient. And as may some of you know, that POCUS is quite a new space, actually. Um, only due to technology, we're able to deliver those ultra-mobile ultrasound solutions that are easy to take with you. And, and now, especially in the COVID situation, we see that it really helps um, in the disinfection um, to make sure mm. that we don't uh, transmission the virus throughout the hospital, um, but that it really can work in confined spaces. Um, also, the, these small ultrasound solutions are easily covered as well as disinfected. So I think it's a perfect solution indeed. And I think we really need to build from here. Um, mm. um, ultra mobile ultrasound is now in, in the hands of so many point of care physicians. So we really need to work on how we can leverage those solutions for more um, clinical use cases. Um, and I, I think also what we see is that um, uh, normally um, 
point of care ultrasound is already used um, in an environment where speed and quality images are very uh, much required. Think about the emergency department, uh, think about the ICU as well, ambulances. Yeah. So I think um, uh, there's more attention to this space. So I hope to see more innovations and that we really can build the level of quality care delivered at point of care from here. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, uh, Caroline is a cardiologist, uh, so her solution from Echo.ai currently is focused on the uh, cardiac diagnosis purpose. Um, but uh, if we look at a bigger picture, right, um, so how, how do we uh, benefit from a portable ultrasound device, a hardware provided by Philips, and the AI modules uh, provided by Echo.ai? work together. So what are the diseases, organs, or body parts you think will have the great potential for this? I'm happy to, to venture some thoughts. I mean, I was already so impressed when you told me about the fetal scanning uh, that, that uh, projects that, that Philips uh, has embarked on. Okay, so I would say that apart from the fetus, <laughs> the heart is actually the most complex organ to image, if I may. I mean, we, we, you have to look at it from all different angles. There are four chambers. It's moving all the time and so on. And so, although we're remaining very, very razor sharp focused on the heart now, I am really hoping that once this is really locked down, that we can look at other organs that are frankly simpler. So the first thing that I'm thinking of now in this COVID season is the lungs. So mm. actually, focus to look for water in the lungs is quite it, very useful. And, and what we do is we look for a curly beeline equivalent in an x-ray, which, which is indicative of water in the lungs. And it's, it's a very important thing. And it, it just requires pointing at the lungs which and counting lines. So, so hopefully, you know, having done with the moving heart and everything that should be okay the other one that's very related is is the carotid it, it's our artery here in the neck and you know when you ultrasound that you can get signs of are there blockages which means a stroke uh, risk of stroke and by looking at the artery in the neck you actually get an idea of the health of the arteries in the entire body because mm -hmm. if you've got deposition here, you likely have it elsewhere as well. So that would be great. And then related to that is also um, arteries of the extremities, the feet. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's really important, especially in a place like Singapore where you know we're, we're diabetes central. Um, and there's a lot of amputations that happen and so on. Uh, you see, if we can use ultrasound to look at the flow in the feet, that's a very important opportunity to catch problems before the horrible stages of amputation and so on occur. So, I mean, it's a very real thing. Here, I just want to highlight something I'm very proud of. So, Echo AI is actually the only commercially available software right now that automatically analyzes Doppler profile. And that's what mm -hmm. you need to look at blood flow. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's not just the two-dimensional images, but the Doppler profiles as well that we automate. And so that I find would be very useful there. And then of course, with the kidneys uh, and, and the liver and so on, they're just organs just sitting there. So hopefully <laughs> what we learn in image recognition and AI would also be able to, to translate there too. Sorry, I've been so greedy. I've gone through, you know, but Marlos, what do you think? Is it feasible? <laughs> yeah, no worries. No, I, I think I had similar thoughts as well. Um, I was also thinking about the lung imaging. Um, I think now nowadays in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, we have a lot of healthcare professionals that are uh, performing ultrasound um, uh, for the first time. Um, and I think we can, AI can help them to perform the ultrasound as well. Mm. Not only doing the diagnosis, but also performing mm. uh, the ultrasound scanning. Um, also, what is really high on my wish list <laughs> is breast imaging. Um, ah. I think a, a lot of women don't get um, uh, breast um, imaging nowadays and I think I would love to see that more in the future as well as doing that pre precision biopsy um, and I think um, AI can help with that so uh, that means that we can provide again the care at the point of care but also do the biopsy um, directly during the, um, uh, the screening. That's such an needed. excellent yeah. point. Yeah. Mm, great yeah. 
so, so um, Maros, we uh, we know that you have a, a rich experience in corporate innovation uh, from your previous roles, and now the innovation is practically the theme for every corporation. So, can you share with us, based on your experience, what are the key factors for an idea uh, is is able to thrive or grow in a corporate environment? Yeah, thank you, Jasmine, for that question and more than happy to share. So I'm actually an, an, an engineer um, and I joined uh, Philips on the innovation and development department. So really working together with the technical guys. But what my role was at uh, that time was representing the voice of the customer throughout the development phase. So that means that we always, when we develop something or we come up with new ideas, we go back to our customers and validate um, the insights, validate the needs, as well as if is this solution solving their needs mm -hmm. so i think when we talk about innovation in big corporates we always talk about customer needs are we understanding the customer needs and can we come up with a solution to overcome their needs their challenges uh, that they face today and also when we um, iterate over time we constantly need to validate the solution with our customers um, I think if we want to, to bring it from, from idea to find a solution that will be launched, it's about what is your minimal viable product? How can we uh, deliver a solution that, that meets those requirements? And do we have a feasible business case with that? Mm. Um, and then from there, we look at like, how can we scale? So skill, skill, skill. That is always the most important question yeah. that is asked about um, from our management. Mm -hmm. um, is there just one customer uh, that has this need? Um, is this across the globe? Um, can we see this in one subsegment, for example, cardiologists, or can we see the same need across different specialists? So it's always thinking about how can we scale the solution to make it more relevant to more uh, customers. Mm -hmm. So I hope that uh, gave you some insights. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, maybe the takeaway for me is uh, one is I uh, need to uh, base on the uh, the need and yes. build on the need and then whether it can build a strong business case and the scalability also is an important consideration. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, so Karen, um, so you know, uh, I, I understand that you are very familiar with SG Innovate, right? You know, we we um, actually we meet uh, uh, many amazing clinicians like yourself. They also want to build commercially viable solutions to address the challenge they face at their work. So all these innovations are clinician led. Um, and you as a, an uh, entrepreneurial scientist, can you share with us how do you identify the great opportunity of AI in echocardiogram um, I, I know just now you mentioned that that is from the uh, that is the actually the idea uh, starting from the CEO of Echo.ai. But from you, why do you choose to work on these opportunities? And uh, what were your considerations in terms of assessing and prioritizing opportunities? Thank you. Wow. Okay, that's a tough question. So again, uh, and this is really sincerely and humbly. Uh, the recognition of the opportunity at first uh, was not mine, mm -hmm. but once I opened my mind to see the possibility, then because I'm a practicing clinician, because I know uh, the patient, and, and also because I'm a clinical trialist, so I, I, I know how ultrasound is deployed in all these settings, um, that's my role. I, I was able to see the applications. And, mm -hmm. and in that sense, um, it's hard not to fall in love with an idea like that. And, you know, it is that dream, that ultimate dream that, my goodness, maybe, maybe if I'm lucky enough, you know, in my lifetime, I've actually done something to move the needle a bit in heart health uh, on, on, a, on a bigger scale. Um, I, I love doing it on a one-to-one -one basis with my patients. But uh, this would be on a larger scale. Mm. And so I, I think it's that that just it's, it's just from the heart. And, and you know, mm. for me, once I know that that is it, then, you know, you focus. But I think one hard learning lesson I, I had, though, I had no idea how much work it takes to 
start a company. Oh my goodness, you know, I think I, I liken it to people telling you how much work it is to have a baby and, and you kind of go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you <laughs> actually, right, get pregnant and, and, and have a baby. So it's that, it's that sense of I'm so humble and it is really, really about teamwork. So, you know, to any clinician out there who wants to start a company, make sure it's coming from that place of fire, you know, because you need it. You, you need it to, to carry it through. And then also, you know, remember, it's about the team. Mm-hmm. I don't have the business acumen. Um, so it, I teamed up with someone who's really good at it, for example. Um, you know, and then the other co-founder is just a top expert at ultrasound. So, you know, the three of us uh, basically have that expertise and then engaged um, the right AI team. Um, um, and then finally, another thing that's really, really important is frankly, Jasmine, I'm not just saying that because it's your show, but uh, is, is the community and support from places like SG Innovate. I mean, imagine, I'm just a cl- clinician. I. I have no idea what the community is, what, where, what move to go next, you know, how to connect, how to find uh, people that we need for our company and so on. And so, you know, I'm very, very grateful to, to SG Innovate, to EDBI who invested in us, you know, um, to, to connections made through Sequoia, uh, you know, all that, that is so critical uh, and we're very, very grateful. Thank you. And I, I would like to also follow up on another question is because um, we don't see that many female co-founders in the ecosystem. So uh, what are the uh, hurdles you think that are stopping um, those on, for them to um, pursue an entrepreneurial dreams? And what advice do you have for them? Oh, I'm not sure I'm qualified to advise. It's my first startup. Uh, But, uh, you know, I I do think that what I had said earlier is for men and women alike. But uh, women in particular, I, I... I do have to say it is a, a balancing act like for, for everyone else, I'm sure. But role models are, are so important and, and just meeting other fellow women in the sphere, it's been really, really encouraging. Um, I, I have to admit, uh, when I first met the CEO of EDBI, who's a lady, mm. I was like completely in awe. You know, and so sort of meeting in person uh, people who have succeeded in this sphere and and seeing how they they do it all that has been very inspiring to me. Thanks. Great. Yeah. So I think now uh, we can move to our Q and A session. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the great discussion. Yeah. Uh, so I have the first question is uh, about um, the competitiveness of. Uh, uh, Echo AI's uh, algorithm. So the question is, there are some uh, several other players attempting to use AI for the radiological diagnosis. How, how do your um, algorithm compare with their, these companies? Thanks so much for that question. And in fact, if we didn't have competitors, then I'd be very worried that am I off <laughs> off when it comes to an idea. So any good idea should have competitors, but we're, we're very fortunate that in ultrasound of the heart, the, the competitors are quite few. So, so first of all, let me distinguish what we do from things that are done in the same way for MRI and CT of the heart. So MRI also has AI for interpretation and so does CT, but remember you can't put an MRI machine or a CT scan machine into your purse. So uh, ultrasound is the last last one to to actually uh, get into this AI swing. And it's because if you look at the images, it's much more grainy. And and, uh, uh, so AI is that much harder uh, to to even recognize which chamber of the heart you're looking at and all that. Um, In competitors in the the, uh, echocardiology space, um, there are some that are offering um, uh, isolated options for AI. For example, there is a company that automates uh, one measurement called ejection fraction uh, with the squeezing function of the heart. Um, There's another company that that looks at how the heart responds in exercise stress, but there's none that actually does the full suite of automation of what, what we do, which is both 2D and Doppler and 
20 measurements, like the whole report. So, so I, I really want to borrow Marlowe's words. Uh, we were looking to put to, together a complete software solution, not just a pinpoint uh, answer to some parts of it. That's great. Um, okay, another question is, um, we have been talking about a lot of using AI for ultrasound um, image interpretation. So how, how do uh, you feel about the use of AI to assist in the acquisition of the imaging? Yeah, in fact, Marlowe's actually brought it up in her very last uh, comment, which is a very important point. See, the good thing is when, when we use AI, the first step um, is to recognize which chamber we're looking at. It's the same AI that can be adapted once we have a hardware partner uh, to guide the acquisition because it's the same thing. You just have to recognize when you get the correct view. So, mm -hmm. so we recognize already the correct view. So we're, we're dying to partner with hardware so that you can then you know, have a probe that you can imagine, you know, goes like red light, orange light, green, you've caught the correct view, you know, and then you stop there. So, so I, I think it's a huge, huge uh, plus there. And, and um, Marlo's actually already brought it up. It's, it's, it's a very important thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add on that. Yeah, I think the um, if we look at how we acquire the image, um, if, if we do that well, then the processing of the image will go much faster. And so there will be less images available. We just capture what we need. And I think that is also very important. So the task that is of performing the ultrasound will also become faster. Mm -hmm. So there we also focus again on the speed. So the speed during taking the exam as well as processing the images after the exam. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, just now there was another aspect of the data acquisition is the uh, reproducibility, uh, which, which is uh, because the nature of the ultrasound right, is uh, operator dependent. So this is the, um, the question that posed uh, by one attendees. Um, so uh, can you please uh, touch on uh, this aspect, how to standardize the protocol that may, may the data can actually be reproduced? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, reproducibility, there are several levels to it. So mm -hmm. one of them is exactly what the, um, the person who asked this good question is saying, is the, the reproducibility of capturing of the images. And there, I think it goes back to the question we just discussed about AI assisted or guided acquisition of the image. And we're not there yet, and hopefully we can be there um, soon. Uh, but the other reproducibility becomes person to person, interpersonal uh, reproducibility. And we know that even if you capture one set of images and use this identical set of images and give it to two cardiologists, you'll get different readings. And this is the part that Echo AI will be 100% reproducible. And that's because we don't pick and choose randomly which cycle, which area to measure. We measure every single frame of every single video that passes a certain confidence or quality score. And there's, there's a very complex layers and layers of, of algorithms there um, to eventually produce a result. But this result will always be reproducibly the same for that same image. So it takes away interperson variability and even intra. So I have to humbly tell you that if you gave me the same echo uh, one day and then a week later, I might give you a different answer too, uh, just in terms of, you know, it just depends where I happen to pick to measure. So, so there are different levels of, of reproducibility we, can, we discussed. Hmm. Okay, uh, then we have another very interesting question is, um, it is known that ultrasound imaging analysis are also highly vendor dependent. Uh, I guess that uh, uh, related to the hardware provider. So will it be potentially critical 
for AI companies such as Echo need to collaborate with uh, multiple big companies and what are the challenges? Ah, so, so um, first of all, that's a very good point. And uh, in fact, Echo AI is vendor neutral as uh, because they all boil down to a certain type of an image called a DICOM image. And as long as it's a DICOM image, Echo AI is going to read it. And we set out to be that way. And in fact, we're going for regulatory approval. Um, and in our regulatory approval, we have to list down in both our development and validation data sets, which not only which vendor, but which machine was used to capture the images that we're going to validate our software on. So we truly are serious about being uh, vendor neutral. Um, uh, sorry, so, so uh, the, the question then was, uh, does, does software have to take into account all of that um, um, in regulatory submissions and so on? Um, oh, and do we have to partner with many different companies? Well, we, we are open um, um, in discussions, but honestly, when we go forward and we want to execute a specific pilot project, for example, pairing a very ultra mobile handheld with our software, I, I think it's wise we, we go with one partner. Um, that, that has, anyway, is our strategy. Marlo's I uh, what, <laughs> what yeah. do you think? No, um, uh, I, I thought it was an interesting point about um, uh, reading the image. So um, when we talk about ultrasound, we know it's very dependent on the technical and clinical skills um, of the person that performs the ultrasound or reads the images. But I think um, image quality is a very important aspect um, when we talk about ultrasound. If we don't have a clear image, it's very difficult to judge judge and we know that the image quality is dependent uh, on uh, the hardware of the provider <laughs> as well as the skills to perform the scan so i think um, you need uh, to guide the the user and ai can help with that and if the, the hardware provider can translate that in a really good image quality um, i think then you'll have a win-win from from both worlds yes mm. Uh, I think we sure. uh, have time for the last question. Uh, so uh, the attendees raised this question is, uh, can you please share your thoughts on using ultrasonic imaging with AI for tumor confirmation without needing a biopsy? Wait. Sorry, I, I don't think I got the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, can you please share your thoughts on using uh, ultrasound image with AI for tumor confirmation without needing a biopsy? Do you think so, this is in relation to your mention of the breast ultrasound? Yes, I, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so the question is to, for, to confirm on a tumor. Um, I think um, it has all, all to do with protocols, right? Um, so it depends on the protocol, for example, for, for, for breast cancer. And I think it's a standard procedure to uh, take a biopsy uh, to better understand um, the tissue um, that you suspect to be cancerous or not. Um, so I think at this moment in time, I, I don't think so. Um, of course, we always look at if there's blood flow in the, in the tumor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think at this moment in time, we just follow the, the current procedures and it might change in the future. Um, uh, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Karen, do you have uh, something to add on? No, no, I, I don't have experience with breast ultrasound, um, but I agree with Marlos that, uh, you know, AI, that the potential of AI is just amazing. I, I, I would not put limits on it. I think just as we now, uh, from a mammogram, you know, we, we know sort of little things like that, whether they're microcalcifications and things like that, that we can guess more or less the characteristic of a tumor. Um, I think ultimately, you know, we're, we're going to learn so much more as we do more. Um, so I, I really agree with Marlos. Yes. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for your participation today, Caroline and Marlos. Yeah, it, I have again so much uh, insights and views from you. And also thank you everybody for tuning in for our events tonight. 
hope uh, you also uh, have gained a lot of uh, insight as I do. Um, stay well and safe. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Caroline. Thank and uh, Alois, Caroline, and Jasmine, could we have you on the screen just for a quick uh, photo taking of the session? It would be very, very good to, to have you uh, raise your hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like a waving. Raise hand. Yep. Like you're waving to your audience. Yep. Just one, two, and three. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be posting the event record on our uh, recording on our social media and we'll send you the link so that you can share that further. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you again. All. Thank you very right. much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.